Eliza McDonough and welcome to The Transcript. This week, The Transcript takes it to the streets to see what the community thinks about vaccine mandates, discusses the annual Clash of the Classes flag football game, and Cheap Thrills eats more food. Coronavirus cases have started rising again in parts of the U.S. following a decline from the summer surge that was mainly driven by the Delta variant. Nationally, the seven-day average of new cases has edged up to about 80,000. Austria is imposing a lockdown Monday on anyone ages 12 or older who is not fully vaccinated against COVID-19, Chancellor Alexander Schallenberg announced. Police officers will make spot checks on anyone moving freely in public. Unvaccinated people are already prohibited from going to entertainment venues, restaurants, hairdressers, and other places that are open to the public. Six more refugees from Afghanistan are expected to arrive in the Pioneer Valley on Saturday, bringing the number of people up to 50 that are being resettled by Catholic charities since October 1st. The agency is facing significant challenges in finding both temporary and permanent housing. Welcome to Hamped Up. Y'all ready for this? With fall sports ending and almost a month remaining until the start of winter athletics, fans of NHS athletics who are looking for a way to satisfy their Blue Devil pride can tune into the Clash of the Classes annual flag football game. The Clash of the Classes game, formerly known as Powder Puff, is a decades-long tradition where female-identifying students engage in a flag football game between junior and senior classes. The game originated after World War II when women found themselves taking over new roles in society. Female high schoolers decided to take over traditionally male fall sports and were met with backlash and ridicule. The game continued in the 70s and as a homecoming tradition across the country and has been known to boost morale and break gender stereotypes about athleticism in football. After a hiatus last year, the game is finally returning and practices are in full swing. We spoke to students and an alumni about what the game means to them and the history of the name Powder Puff and how they feel about the name change to Clash of the Classes. Um, I don't think that the name change was necessary um, just because Powder Puff is obviously something that's related to makeup and like inherently feminine um, and like ch have it feeling the need to change it from Powder Puff kind of seems stupid because like we're playing football, but we're also feminine. I don't know, it doesn't really make sense to me. I think that um, the football game should still be called Powder Puff, personally. Yeah, I agree as well. I think it's kind of, we reclaim the name. Exactly. And like, if we don't think there's a problem with it as players, then I think we can, the name can be whatever we want it to be. Um, I think it was a really good idea because I feel that Powder Puff was ancient and needed to be fu um, modernized. Um, I personally, like, I get why the name change happened, but I also think that Powder Puff is really classic and I think it has a better ring to it and I think everybody already knows what, like, Powder Puff means, so. It, gender roles do play a part in this game because you are basically dumbing down football for girls to play it and there's no any there's not any physical contact involved so it's yeah yeah they think we're soft we're not seniors <laughs> okay so i think like on one hand yes it's very empowering for like girls to be able to finally play football and like you know get their own taste of the sport but like it's not real football it's kind of like being micromanaged at all times by class officers, by the like coaches who are like usually boys also. It's all just like very controlled, which is kind of the opposite of what normal football is like. So I definitely think that gender roles and gender stereotypes play a large role like in the powder puff environment in the world. Thanks for watching. Make sure to come to the game on the 28th at 6 p.m. under the lights. See you next week. On the days before Northampton High School was set to open, there was mold found around the school. The highest impact was the Black Box Theater. The Black Box is still being worked on to this day. We talked to Mr. Eldridge and students from the theater program about how this has affected their studies. The Black Box in its past meant a community. It was always nice to go into there and to find someone I know and to be comfortable in there. It was a good space. 
moving forward, I hope the black box can continue to be that same gathering space that I've known it to be and to really let people, anyone who wants to come, come in and be a part of it. I can tell you that when I came into the building 16 and a half years ago, this room was uh, an aerobics studio. When they renovated the high school in 1998, for some reason they thought it would be a good idea to have an aerobics studio. So this whole place was beige. There was a red rubber mat on the floor, you know, like one of those rubber gym mats. And, uh, and nobody was using it for anything because n nobody was doing aerobics. Um, and nobody wanted the room. Uh, and when the principal hired me, they couldn't believe that I wanted this room. And I said, are you kidding me for theater? Uh, a room with high ceilings and no windows, you, you couldn't make me happier. They didn't discover the mold in here until 7 p.m. on the night before the first day of school. So the mold came in like a tidal wave. I mean, I, I was here as usual in the evening, you know, running around trying to get it set up for my first day of classes. And they came in and started going around and shining lights on things and then walked up to me and said, this room has mold in it, we have to close it. So we've been behind the eight ball ever since. And it's, um, and it's been terribly difficult because I think at times they thought they had got it cleaned up and then would discover they didn't. And, and so we never knew when the room was going to be ready. It's only just been opened up. The first problem is, is that every single thing that was in here is gone. So, which is, I'm still trying to adjust to. So I had a huge script library. And all the scripts were thrown away. All of my textbooks were thrown away. All of, every book, just about every book was thrown away. All of the theater curtains that I had created were in here, they were torn down and thrown away. All of the movie theater seats from Pleasant Street had to be torn out. I will say there are kids who are starting to walk in the door and say, hey, the, either the black box is back or hey, what is this? Right, and, and that's kind of what you operate off of is curiosity and excitement you know, for something like theater. Theater Tech meets on Mondays at 3.30 and the Drama Club meets on Wednesdays at 3.30. Thanks for watching. Last week, it was stated in Hello Hamp that all movement breaks must be held inside the classroom unless escorted by an ESP. Many students have worries about this as students may not be able to access accommodations, especially with the limited ESPs the school has. We talked to students with 504s and IEPs and NHS Associate Principal Ms. Sheridan to hear their opinions and clear up rumors surrounding the policy. I think that not being able to access the hallways during class will definitely affect me because I have ADHD and sometimes I just need to step outside of the classroom, go for a walk, and without that I probably won't be able to focus in class. I think that at NHS there are a lot of undiagnosed diagnosed students and um, ones without a 504 plan or an IEP and I think that these movement breaks that are allowed to all kids are not going to be available to them and I think that's definitely an issue because they need those breaks just as much as someone that is diagnosed might. I think overall, it seems pretty simple. Just kind of give the kids what they need instead of having to make all these rules and setting all these boundaries. It's just easy. As somebody with ADHD who needs to access movement breaks uh, to feel accommodated and to have a good day at school and be able to focus, uh, not being able to access movement breaks uh, will make the school day much more difficult. Uh, and I know a lot of people are feeling the same way. One of the ways that I would change the PASS system to be more inclusive is I wouldn't make somebody wait to be accompanied by an ESP or, or, or wait for any sort of special uh, accompaniment to access their accommodations. You know, frequently when people need movement breaks, it's there, it's in the moment. And I think it'll be detrimental to both students learning and also their mental health uh, if they need to wait to be able to access that. So that is a complete non-starter for me. I don't think that this new policy is actually getting to the root issue of the vandalism. Uh, I don't see how restricting students' ability to access their accommodations, something that I feel is a fundamental educational right, is going to improve the well-being of students or staff in any way possible. It'll create more disruptions, it'll create more issues, and it'll make school so much worse for so many people. There are some misunderstandings about the past system that we have in place. Uh, one of the misunderstandings is that folks believe that this is a new system. The system has been in place for as long as I've been at NHS uh, and prior to my role here as an associate principal I was the athletic director so 
It's been in place for at least eight years, if not longer. Movement breaks are also a part of our students with special needs or with additional services, uh, their, their experience at NHS. Um, that hasn't changed. That has been a part of accommodations listed through their IEPs or their 504s. Um, and we are not restricting students' access to accommodations. What we are doing is reiterating the current process or the process that's been in place for years. Well, if a student does not have an IEP or a 504, then we encourage our teachers to work with them and their whole classes around group movement breaks within the class. If students have any questions or worries or concerns about anything that's happening in our building, the administrative team, me, Ms. Harrison, Ms. Valcourt, we want to hear from our students directly about how things are going, what challenges they're facing, what we can do to support them. And one way we are trying to open up those lines of communication is through open flex, where students can sign up to meet with any one of us to bring concerns to the table. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Welcome to Fast Food Game Show. In this edition of The Game Show Show, instead of true or false, we'll be presenting a menu item that the participant we'll have to match to the fast food chain that the item comes from. We've got these four chains here. All right. This is the first <laughs> item. The banana minion shake um, from Japan. And it was accompanied by a banana minion waffle cone. The shakes do appear in other places around the world, but they're not minion themed. Which do you think this is from? They serve waffle cones at any of these restaurants? Uh or they used to. These could be like... I want to see McDonald's, because I know there is Minion toys there. Okay. So that's my final answer. This coffee cup. This okay. unique coffee cup is from the UK, UK, and you can literally eat the cup. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I feel like Starbucks is the obvious answer, but I feel like Starbucks would also not look like that. You know, there'd be the green colors with their prominent logo. But also, it's based in Washington and Seattle's in Washington, so. Yeah. Just keep that in mind. Where's that? <laughs> <laughs> like Washington, D.C.? No, Washington State. That's a state? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I thought you said it was from the UK. Yeah, but it says Seattle's best coffee. Oh, okay. <laughs> that gives me no information, but um, uh, let's see. I'm gonna guess KFC because it's red. Okay. McDonald's <laughs> is also red now. Yeah, but like, yeah, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm gonna keep it at KFC. A burger pizza. Uh, in 2010, this fast food chain came out with a ginormous burger shaped like a pizza. Well, not shaped, more like big as a pizza. How many patties does it have on it? Probably just like one, but it's one massive one. That would be a pain to fry, like trying to flip that giant patty. You see. <laughs> this is why it didn't catch on. So in a different country, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll go with Burger King again. That's my guess. This is the upside down burger. <laughs> and <laughs> it was um real. it was these are all real, I guarantee you. <laughs> This burger is literally just an upside down burger. It was made to promote Stranger Things and was based on the upside down, an alternate dimension from the show. <laughs> what, did you split this? It's not even the burger, it's just the image. This is, yeah, this isn't like the actual burger. This is oh. like, because the, the actual burger had too much like of the, the logo on it. Okay. So I had to use this. Uh, Burger King, because they have like the impossible Whopper okay. there. So I feel like they'd have like the upside down Whopper. So yeah, that's it. Now we... <laughs> Welcome to Cheap Thrills. This week we went to Sylvester's, a historic site and restaurant in downtown Northampton for over 38 years. This week we went to see what the Valley nominated best brunch in town had to offer.
Well, I'm, I'm actually, how long have I been managing at Sylvester's? I'm actually pretty new to the management team, so I've only been managing for uh, about six months now. Uh, but I did grow up in these businesses, um, and I've been a part of them for my whole life. Uh, so, you know, in many ways I've been here forever. In some ways I've only been here a, a very short time. So we expected that there would be a big change in customers uh, and business when we reopened. We, we were sort of hesitant, you know, we didn't know if it was going to be busy, if people were going to, you know, remember that we were around before the pandemic. Uh, but um, unexpectedly, we were, you know, busy as we'd always had been. So uh, that was really a great surprise for us. You know, our, our old regular customers turned out really well and, you know, they seem to be still having a good time even though things have changed a little bit. Um, we. Uh, you know, to keep up with the success, I think our, our best bet is to just stay true to our core principles, which are, you know, to be committed to local and sustainable foods, uh, to take care of our people, and, you know, to be committed to the community. Okay, so we just put in our orders for our food, but they also gave us some pastries, so thank you, Chris. Uh, first up, I'm going to try the banana bread. It's house-made local ingredients. The banana bread. I think it was, it's really, like, moist in a way but not like too like dry or like wet sometimes i'll like go to like a cafe and their bread is like stale by this time of the day but it's still like really good right now so we just finished our meals at sylvester's i got the california eggs benedict and bella got avocado toast um and what i have to say is they really, like for being such a historic restaurant, they've stood the test of time. Because these are like more like trendy dishes, I would say. Cause it's like avocado toast, like eggs benedict, and like with spinach and tomatoes. So it's more like LA, like New York brunch. But I really loved all the food. I thought it was really good. I'm really full afterwards. Um, however, my only criticism is, I think there needs to be more seasoning on the food because it was like, it was a little bit like blandish for because it wasn't seasoned, but I think that is to make it more palatable to like everyone. But overall, like Sylvester's was really solid. I thought it was a great place to get lunch and I highly recommend. Thanks for watching and thank you so much to Chris at Sylvester's. We'll see you next week. Hi everyone. Welcome to Big Chuck's Kitchen. I'm your host, Big Chuck. This week, we're doing another Thanksgiving episode, and I'm just gonna cook normal Thanksgiving. So, here we go. I've got potatoes over here. Um, oh, f Cut, cut. You can't swear on local television, Chuck. I've already told you this about three times. I'm the finest chef in the state and you're telling me I can't swear. You're giving me shit equipment, half a cutting board. You're giving me the bluntest knife I've ever seen. I could stab you with this and you'd be fine. A che rusty cheese grater. There's, my cheese is full of rust. Full of rust. I don't know what you want me to do here, sir. What's wrong with you? Thank you so much for watching. Come to next yoga club meeting next Tuesday at 6 p.m. in the community room across from the girls' bathroom on the second floor. See you next week.
talking at the transcript 